Hello, and welcome to Sovereign Financials, financial education for everyone. Hi guys, welcome back to Sovereign Financials. This week we're going to talk about six ways to prepare for the next market crash. The purpose of this video is to try to get us prepared for what's coming next and make sure that we are positioned well to take advantage of any negative outcomes that the economy has in the future. So the first goal in preparation for the next market crash would be job security. Unfortunately, the first thing that happens in a recession or depression is there's job cuts. They'll either cut your job completely with massive layoffs as companies become unprofitable, or they start cutting down numbers of hours that are worked as the demand for products goes down, or they just don't need that much work hours to produce products. So the first thing I recommend, if you can, is renew your contract with your employer. This can set you up for a longer period of time that you'll know, basically to have guaranteed employment or try to have a backup job available. You know, if you have friends that have a similar job at another location, get in contact with them and just kind of get a feel uh, where else you could potentially work if, if something bad were to happen in the economy and your company were to lay off people. The second thing I recommend is be good at your job. You know, keep productive, be a good team player, make sure that the ball's rolling, make sure that your supervisors know that you're doing a good job. You know, whenever they're going to have layoffs at a company, they try to pick off the people that are the least productive and get rid of them first. So if you're super productive and very good at your job and you make a real impact on a company's profitability, you're much more likely to be kept around. So just keeping productive will likely give you good job security there. The next thing I would do is make sure that your CV or your resume is up to date. You know, like I said, just in case there is any kind of layoffs, that you have that ready and for job applications because you want to if there is any layoff, you want to minimize the time that you don't have a job so that you get to keep as much cash in your savings as possible and be able to pay your bills and everything. And then, like I said before, it's like just make sure you keep all your bridges like in contact, you know, like make sure that if you have, you know, old employers that you worked with or friends at other places, just make sure you, you know, kind of update your relationships with them, make sure that everything's going well, just so you have backups if, if you need to. The second goal in preparation for a market crash would be to keep your debt levels low. So during a deflationary cycle, which means, you know, as the economy slows down and people buy less products and everything, debt becomes a very large burden because there are layoffs or hours are getting cut. So if you keep your debts really low, that keeps down the payments on stuff that you have to pay for. So if you have car loans, student loans, credit cards, and you're making these payments every month and there's either a reduction in your hours or a loss of job, you have to keep making these payments, which then reduces the amount of money in your savings account, and then you're able to survive for a less amount of time. You know, if your debts get too high, and let's say there's a cutback on your hours, then you start have to sell stuff off. Like in the 2008 crash, you know, jobs go down, uh, hours get cut, people can't make their house payments anymore, and then they're forced to sell their houses or whatever other assets they have. So keeping your debt levels low will keep your maintenance costs basically low so that if there is any kind of recession or downturn that you'll be able you won't have to make that big of payments on them. So let's just go over a little example here. Let's say your income is $4,000 a month, and for rent, you pay $1,800. Your car payment is $500, and your credit card payment is $600. In the end of the month, you have $1,100 left in order to make whatever expenses you have, such as groceries, uh, eating out, entertainment, etc. However, if there is a downturn, and let's say your income gets cut back because there's a lack of hours at your work. So instead of working, let's say, 40 hours a week, they cut you back to 36 hours a week or something to that regard. Let's say your income becomes $3,000 a month. Now you still go down the line, your expenses, since your debt, it has, you have a certain amount of debt, stays the same. Now you only have $100 left in order to buy food and groceries and whatever entertainment you have. This is the power of having high debt and why it's something that should be avoided. Because if your debt is high, those numbers can't be changed. And if you're forced to have a lower income because of reduction in hours or your job is lost, the amount of actual free cash flow, which is the amount of money that you have left over at the end of the month to expend on whatever you like, is greatly diminished. So this is why I highly recommend you keep your debt low. The third goal we have is to keep cash on hand. And how much cash on hand is the question we should have, right? I recommend that you keep 15 to 30% cash position. Now, if you think the market is going to come down sooner rather than later, then maybe a 30% cash position would be good. 
if you think it's going to be a little bit further off, then maybe cut down to 15%. You know, somewhere around 20% is probably a good number. This has multiple benefits. One is if there is a cutback in hours or a job loss, you have more cash on hand to make payments on your loans, such as your car and your house, and you won't lose those assets and have to sell them really cheap just to kind of make up the difference. The other stuff is you'll be able to deploy your capital in a crash to buy assets that are selling for cheap. So if somebody, there's a big market crash and people get scared off, like I'm selling all my stocks, I'm selling my house, I'm selling all this other stuff, you'll have the cash available to go buy those things on the cheap and then you get to ride out the next market cycle as they start going up. That's a great investment, you know. People during the Great Depression, that's one of the time when the most millionaires was ever made was people being able to buy things during the Great Depression for pennies on the dollar and then after the 40s and 50s during the recovery, those assets went greatly up in price and then people had a lot of extra money. Some of the things you'd be able to buy, you know, is if you don't currently have a house for yourself, if there's a market crash and you have the cash on hand for a down payment and a couple months of uh, something called PITI, P-I-T-I, you know, principal, interest, tax and insurance. If you have those saved up and you have a good down payment, banks will be more willing to give you a loan to buy your own house. Or if you already have a house, you will be able to buy a rental property for a pretty inexpensive price that you can then you know, that will appreciate during the next market run up and also bring you income as, as people are renting from you. And then, like I said before, you know, stocks and bonds and everything else gets cheaper during a recession or a market crash. And then that way you have the cash to immediately go out there and buy stuff up. Whereas if the market crashes and then you try to save up money to buy those things, you'll, ha you'll accumulate less of those assets prior to the next market run up. The fourth goal I would recommend is to take profits on some of the investments that you've had that have gone up significantly. We've had an amazing bull run since 2010 to 2018. That's past eight years, essentially nothing but gains. I would start taking a look at some of the investments that you have. If you look at my previous videos about PE ratios, anything with a PE ratio over 20 or 25 might be a good idea to take some profits and sell some of those things. If you have real estate with a significant amount of equity, you know, if you bought a house for 400000 and now it's worth $650,000, this might be a better time to sell it off now, take that equity, and either invest it in something else or just hold that as cash on hand so that you can be able to buy your next investment during the next market downturn. If you have any junk bonds, like high yield bonds, essentially like non-investment grade bonds, things that where people are unlikely to pay you back that are paying high interest rates, those are usually the things that get hit hardest in the beginning of a market downturn. At this point in the market cycle, I would probably completely eliminate junk bonds or high yield bonds. And then if you have any overpriced art or collectibles, you know, those things have just skyrocketed in value in the past couple of years. That would might be a good time to take some profits on that as well. And I'm not saying sell off all of your stocks, all of your real estate, all of your high yield bonds, although the high yield bonds might be a good idea to actually get rid of, and all of your art or collectibles, but take some profits on some of those things. Have that cash on hand so that you can invest during the next market downturn. The fifth goal that we have is I wouldn't make any large investments right now. If you you know were to go out right now and buy a house, let's say a, a, to rent for a rental property, you'd be buying at the top of a bubble. Just like in 2005, 2006, people went in, bought at the top of a bubble, the bubble crashes, then you're immediately in the negative. If you bought a house for 650000 and the market crashes and now it's only worth 400000 after the crash, you're $200,000 in the hole. And you know even though you're trying to cl collect that rental income, you're technically you know, in a large negative number, which would just be a bad place to be during a crash. You'd rather be in a positive number and then have that money to deploy to buy other assets up. If you couldn't pay back the loan, let's say from the rent that you're obtaining, then you'd have to sell, sell the real estate during the crash. So if you bought it for 600000 it went crash out of 400000 then you have a problem finding a renter that can pay the mortgage for essentially a $600,000 loan. You'd have to sell that house at a cheaper price than what you paid for it, and then you'd really be in the negative. Now you would owe the bank some money. And that's kind of what happened during the 2008, 2009 market crash too. You just wouldn't want to be in that position. Also, you know, buying stocks or bonds right now, the top of a bubble would be a bad idea. It's much better to have that cash on hand instead and just be prepared for the short-term future where there might be a, a correction and you can then deploy that capital and buy up cheap assets instead. And let, when the market starts going up, then you're making profits. Our sixth goal is to have a 10% market hedge. And the question is like, okay, what's a hedge, right? A hedge is if the rest of the market goes down, maybe these assets will go up. And back in the day before, I mean, let's say before 2005-ish, 2004-ish, 
and any investment fund would have a 5% hedge, which meant that 5% of their total net worth was in essentially gold and silver, and whether it's gold and silver stocks, mining stocks, or actually physical gold and silver, but something like that. And the purpose of this is if the stock market was going up, gold and silver would go down. And then when this, and then as the stock market was going up, they would start selling off some of their stocks and buying more gold to basically bring it up to a 5%. The market would then crash like it does every like eight, you know, eight years roughly. And then gold and silver go up, kind of look at the 2013 bubble that happened after the market crash of 2009. Gold and silver goes up. And then as gold and silver goes up, because the rest of the market's going down, people get scared and trying to find a safe place to put their money. So they put in gold and silver. Then they start selling off some of that gold and silver and then start buying stocks and bonds on the cheap. And you just kind of repeat the cycle. You know, stock market's going up. You sell some stock, you buy gold. Stock market goes down. That means gold went up. Sell some of the gold, buy more stocks and bonds, and just rinse and repeat this. Now, during the later part of a market cycle, where I think we're near the top, I think it'd be better to have a 10% hedge, meaning that 10% of your net worth should be in stuff like either physical gold, physical silver, or potentially in other stuff too, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I would first break this down into two parts. One is, is keep 5% in physical gold or silver. And when I say physical, I mean like literally go to, you know, jmbullion.com or providentmetals.com, both of which websites are companies I, I use very frequently and I have no problem with them. I buy that 5%, so either buy maybe 50% silver, 50% gold, and actually keep those like in a safety deposit box or somewhere safe. Not in your house though, just so you don't get robbed or anything like that. But keep those somewhere safe, like say a safety deposit box or pay, paid for a vault or something. And then that's kind of like your protection against a market crash. And if the market crashes, usually those things go up and you can sell it off. Or if there's inflation, you know, those things usually go up and you start selling some off. The second part is now we are, we're in a digital age. So I would actually recommend keeping a 5% of your of your total portfolio as a cryptocurrency hedge. So if you take 5% from gold and silver and then 5% in cryptocurrency, it would give you a total 10% hedge of your net worth. And I think that would play a very important role. You know, I don't really see us going back to using gold and silver as money. I think that's you know pretty barbaric. I mean, we're not going to go back to pinching dust to buy a Coke. It's much more likely that we'll end up using cryptocurrency in the future. So if you were to have 5% of a cryptocurrency hedge, I would put at least 75% of that hedge in Bitcoin. The actual recommendation I would give probably is 80% Bitcoin, 10% Ethereum. And if you can figure out how to use Monero, it's kind of hard to hold. You probably have to hold it on an exchange like Binance or something, or buy a ledger and figure out how to download the blockchain. Monero is a little more of a tricky area, but maybe 10% Monero. If not, do maybe 90% Bitcoin, just 10% Ethereum. If you had that, I think you would be pretty set. I mean, I think the cryptocurrency is a great hedge against the future. It's a hedge against inflation. The gold and silver has been a hedge for you know 5,000 years, which is a great idea to keep, I think, at the top of a bubble. And then if you just follow up with the rest of the six goals in total, I think you'd be really prepared for a market crash. And I think you'd just be really well-rounded for, for the future. The sixth goal, which I'm not really going to create a slide for, would just be self-education, you know, reading books, about personal finances and the economy would greatly be able to in, you know, improve your perspective of everything and kind of understand where you want to go for the future. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, I'll have another video for you guys next week. If you liked my video, I would appreciate it if you come down in the bottom right-hand corner here, like it, subscribe. If you'd like to know when I release a new video, just hit the little bell next to it and it'll alert you. All right, thanks, guys. Um, also, I will be putting a link down for both uh, how to get Bitcoin, how to use Binance, and the website for gold and silver, which is JM Bullion and Provenant Metals down in the comments. Let me know what you guys think about the video. Appreciate it. Bye.